give the floor to Georg Holdeny, please. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. And uh, dear, uh, oh no, it's not me. That's this one. This is original. So uh, many thanks, Jan. Uh, the distinguished guest, uh, dear uh, President uh, Bassi and Vice President, Madam Metzola, and dear Manfred, this Mr. Weber, her chairman, uh, he made up uh, the possibility to us uh, to organize such a kind of uh, um, dialogue and uh, dear colleagues. And really, I believe this, this is a really great opportunity after the long time that the EPP group is focusing on the demographic challenges. And I am really glad that we are doing so today uh, and really on the, such a high level uh, with the participation uh, uh, with, uh, with Manfred Weber, or chairman. Uh, it is important uh, for us to politicians, uh, if we are talking about future of Europe is in the cen center of every discussion, we are strongly positioning uh, the democratic, uh, democratic, uh, demographic, uh, democratic and demographic uh, uh, issues as well. Uh, the number of the participation show us uh, also in these moments already, the importance of this uh, uh, topic and the fact that instead of the usual one hour, as uh, um, Jan mentioned, uh, Mr. Uh, Orbich mentioned, we are now trying to point out uh, most uh, pressing issues on one and a half hours. But first of all, I have to start with myself. We have to take uh, under control ourselves and we strictly, we have to uh, keep or time uh, the limit, uh, the, the, the time of the, uh, the limit of the speaking time, uh, about seven minutes. Jan, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, this is the immediately, I think, the Nicola Speranza, Secretary General of Federation of Catholic Terminal Association in Europe, will take the floor, please. Nicola, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wait. Uh, I will. Uh, I will speak into in, in French. So I leave just a second for for the translators to switch the languages. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Alveni. Merci à vous, Monsieur Albrecht, pour uh, pour cette possibilité aussi de parler ensemble des États généraux de la natalité et aussi pour l'excellente coopération avec l'unité pour le dialogue interculturel du groupe PPE. Euh, merci notamment au président du groupe, Monsieur Weber, et au secrétaire général aussi, Simon Boussoutil, et aux nombreux députés qui sont ici aujourd'hui avec nous, qui ont, ont adapté leur, leurs agendas euh, pour être présents aujourd'hui ici avec nous. Quelqu'un euh, m'a posé la question Qu'est-ce qu'il y a derrière ce, ce webinaire La réponse est simple. Notre volonté d'alerter sur l'hiver démographique, comme notre fédération le fait depuis des années. Nous avons la mission de parler euh, et, et d'alerter et de parler avec tout le monde. Et en tant que représentant des 27 associations familiales de 17 pays différents, nous avons la responsabilité de porter la voix des familles et leurs inquiétudes réelles, quotidiennes, auprès des institutions européennes. Mais cela représente seulement un pied volé de la mission de notre fédération. Notre aspect est celui de favoriser le réseau et la mise en commun des expériences des associations familiales catholiques en Europe et celui d'en assurer le développement pour le bien commun. D'où la présence ici, aujourd'hui, de certains des plus importants responsables d'associations familiales dans l'Union européenne. Quel est le rôle de ces associations Dans un monde dans lequel l'individualisme et le consumérisme semblent prévaloir, nos associations offrent pour la solidarité dans la lutte contre la pandémie cachée de nos jours, qui est la solitude. La solitude est étroitement liée au changement démographique que nous vivons aujourd'hui en Europe, qui est le thème de ce webinaire aujourd'hui. 
alors que les personnes âgées constituent un groupe de plus en plus important dans la population et que les Européens ont de moins en moins d'enfants, comme le souligne le document de réflexion que nous avons publié avec la COMEC sur les personnes âgées et l'avenir de l'Europe, le fait que les Européens vivent plus longtemps est une très bonne nouvelle. Ce n'est pas quelque chose de laquelle il faut se plaindre. Mais en même temps, l'Union européenne, il faut, il faut se le dire, il faut, il faut le, le dire avec clarté, l'Union européenne, l'Europe, a de moins en moins d'enfants. Le 5 mars 2021, le Parlement européen, la Commission européenne et le Conseil de l'Union européenne ont publié une déclaration commune pour la Conférence sur l'avenir de l'Europe qui comprenait la solidarité intergénérationnelle comme sujet clé. Cependant, la solidarité intergénérationnelle, ce qui veut dire entre plusieurs générations, ne peut pas exister sans une nouvelle génération pour la soutenir alors que nous allons vers une société, on pourrait dire, monogénérationnelle. Et la famille, dans cet échange entre les générations, la famille est le hub, on dirait, vous me permettrez en anglais, on pourrait dire en français, le pôle central de cet échange. Au cours de la crise, de la crise mondiale actuelle, cela est devenu encore plus clair. En effet, comme la force et la maintes fois souligné, au cours de ces dernières années, les familles représentent le cœur de la reprise post-pandémique. Les états généraux de la natalité à Rome, le 14 mai dernier, ont représenté un moment historique, car pour la première, la première fois, celle qui se présente comme la classe dirigeante d'un pays s'est réunie avec le premier ministre Mario Draghi autour du sujet de la natalité un peu comme nous le faisons aujourd'hui, reconnaissant l'urgence d'agir de manière concrète pour des politiques qui remettent la famille au centre. Car, et là je cite le pape François euh, qui a ouvert les états généraux de la natalité, « Si les familles ne sont pas au centre du présent, il n'y aura pas d'avenir. Mais si les familles repartent, tout repart. » La présence du pape François a donné aux États généraux de la natalité un écho qui va bien au-delà des Alpes. La question du changement démographique est une question européenne, mais pas seulement européenne, même globale. Il suffit de lire cette semaine le New York Times, qui a parlé de changements liés au vieillissement des populations, des changements glo glo globaux, d'une ampleur difficile à croire. Ou bien, il suffit de voir aussi le changement de politique en Chine qui, jusqu'il y a quelques années, avait promu la politique de l'enfant unique. Notre avenir est un jeu et ce webinaire s'insère donc à juste titre dans le cadre de la conférence sur l'avenir de l'Europe. Nous sommes ravis de ce dialogue avec les députés européens aujourd'hui. Ce contexte, les associations familiales ont un rôle important car elles font en sorte que les familles, et là je me permets de citer l'encyclique Familiaris Consortio qui est un des documents fondateurs de notre travail et ça me permet aussi de rendre hommage au, au pays de notre modérateur, euh, il, dit, il écrivait de manière assez prophétique que les familles euh, doivent prendre une conscience toujours plus vive d'être les protagonistes de ce qu'on appelle la politique familiale et qu'elles assument la responsabilité de transformer la société. Et cette responsabilité que comme association familiale catholique en Europe, nous sommes en train de, de, prendre, euh, avec, de, de nous prendre avec, euh, avec ce dialogue aujourd'hui avec vous. Merci beaucoup. Yes, uh, thank you very much. As you know, as you noted, the, uh, we are the co-organizer of this uh, uh, seminar with the Federation, but uh, 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 thanks to the uh, Federation, it's uh, me that I became the moderator. So this is this kind of division of labor. So thank you very much indeed. Now we, have, we will have a chance to, to listen to very 
two very important persons. I don't want to say just VIPs, but very important person so for this um, uh, uh, what, for this kind of debate. First, I have the big honor to uh, to uh, give the floor to Manfred Weber, who is our our chairman of our EPP group and not a very important politician in, in Europe, but also the one of the uh, person who is active in the Catholic uh, uh, um, associations in, in Germany. So um, uh, Manfred, the floor is yours. And I do this engagement in the Catholic uh, world in Germany together with Ulrich Hoffmann, which I want to greet here. So good to see you. Uh, Mr. President Bassi and also Mr. Secretary General uh, Speranza, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, uh, I'm very happy that we have such an engaged uh, group inside of the EPP uh, group who are, who are driving the debates about, the real debates about the future of Europe, let me say it in this way. Uh, you know that we as EPP group, as Christian Democrats on this, uh, on European level, we we tried always to to do a value based uh, policy and uh, politics and that is always our driving element and uh, families and what you are fighting for so healthy and strong families are in our thinking the fundament of the basic architecture of our societies and that's why it's 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 fundamental to 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 care about and to to deal about the problems of families of today so that's why I'm really very happy to have this exchange of views to find a common understanding about what is ahead of us and having especially now the demographic challenge in mind i only want to to to, to put uh, one one figure on the table which, which was in my note in the preparation for today's meeting and which impressed me a lot uh, we we had in the last in the years from 2015 to 2019 in four years the labor market in europe lost 26 million people workers and new and added new workers of around 22 million. So we lost around 4 million workers in four years time for the labor market. I know that's only one element, labor market and jobs and so on, but it gives a little bit an idea about the dimension we speak about, huh? that, we, that we lose also economic strength with this, with this development. And that is, that's why to call it this um, demographic winter, like you said it, like you mentioned it, is I think a good a good wording to to give us an idea about what is ahead of us. Um, uh, today, I think the most important thing is for us as politicians is to listen because you are dealing with family issues. Uh, uh, that's your that's your job. That's your mission, and that's why it's for us important to listen. Um, for uh, for us, I think it's on the starting point the most important debate first of all about how we do we define families. Huh? Uh, because that is also one of the debates all over Europe. So what are the modern forms of families? So I would say that families should be seen in a more broader sense. So also my grandmother and grandfathers are part of a family thinking. And additionally, I would say that family is mainly also where we take care of our children, because that is uh, for sure the most important that we care about their future. And um, and uh, and for 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 this, I think uh, having this in mind that demographic developments, then there are also linked some uh, with this development. There are for sure also them linked to some concerns for the future. For example, in societies where we have less young generation and more old elderly generation, we are risking to enter in the situation where innovation is not so much attractive. And stability and also consumptions is probably more interesting. Eh? Young generation, uh, young societies, like we have it, for example, in South America, are very dynamic societies, are very future oriented societies. And elderly societies are in the risk to become a little bit more safety oriented and stability oriented. So that is one of the concerns I think we must have in mind when we speak about this demographic development. Let me add a, a poorly European internally uh, a dimension also to this because th uh, th this demographic development where we lose young generation uh, and is also, uh, is also fueling the brain drain debate in the European Union. Yesterday I had a discussion with uh, president of Romania, our friend Klaus uh, Johannes. Uh, and when we speak about Romania, for example, then you see that 
a lot of young people are leaving, uh, are going to Austria, to Belgium, to France, to Germany, to doing their their studies there, and especially the talents are going uh, to to the to the other to the other countries. They can earn more money and have better jobs, and that is an, an additional effect of these demographic uh, developments. And this is even increasing problems in the poorer part of Europe where we have to take care as European policymakers. And finally, in all these points of, um, of a family, the key question is now, what can we do? Uh, what is our role as European lawmakers, as European politicians? I want to be, I want to mention, I want to tell you that I am a little bit proud that we are the EPP group. We were the first party, the first group who did a, a report on rights of children, because if we care about children, we have to define their rights and their, their minimum requirements. And we did so as a group a few weeks ago. I think we have to care about young families. Uh, and that means in Corona times, first of all, to not speak too much about fears and concerns. We need hope. We need an atmosphere of a positive perspective for the future and not so much about concerns and, 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 and fears. We have uh, to speak about jobs uh, because economic certainty is key for, for creating a family and establishing a family. Uh, uh, without this economic stability, it's not easy to have trust into the future and hope for the future. And that's why jobs, jobs, jobs is one of our key priorities as EPP group when we speak about the next upcoming weeks. And, uh, and finally, it has a lot to do with respect towards families, respect, an atmosphere of respect towards those who have the future in their, in their, in their hands. And if I may be also very, very clear at the end of my short introduction, I would say we, we speak a lot in the European Parliament and the colleagues can confirm this about, uh, about gender. So hopefully the female colleagues don't, don't criticize me for this, but that's needed and that's important and let's do this. Uh, gender is an important issue. We speak a lot in the European Parliament about, uh, about uh, gay and, and homosexual things and so on, which is also important that we guarantee that everybody can live how he wants to live or she wants to live, no doubt about this. But we speak a little bit too less about, about families, about, uh, about this, this, basic, this basic piece of, of our architecture of our societies. And that's why to push for this and to find the concrete issues to initiate a debate about families is, uh, is I think, needed. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to say a few words at the beginning. And I am really interested about what we can learn today as, as lawmakers and politicians on European level. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I think that uh, uh, for our friends in the Federation, it's very clear what you said about how we treat as EPP the debate about future of Europe. Let's make it very, very concrete and very practical and very important for the, for the people, for the citizens, for very well. So our family is very close uh, for, the, for, for the people. I would like now to give the floor to Honorevole um, uh, Vicenzo Bassi. Uh, 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 allora, Vicenzo Bassi, c'est à vous, or it's up to you uh, uh, to, give the, to, to give us the, uh, your, your uh, welcome message. Yes, please. Comme, comme je disais, je suis épuisé à rencontrer les personnes par Zoom, mais ça, c'est le moment qu'on vit. J'espère de, 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 de vous rencontrer le plus tôt possible en personne. Et maintenant, je parle anglais parce qu'il faut aussi essayer d'avoir un balance entre les langues. I will speak English. And thank you very much, because I have to say that I am very moved because I don't think that we could do the, such a seminar, I don't know, five years ago. We are doing it now, and for me, is a, a real, uh, is a big moment for my engagement as volunteer as a president of FAFSE. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's uh, for me a real award of our work, and uh, I'm sincere with you. So, uh, and it was always very difficult in the past to speak about uh, about demography, and we know also why. Because if you look at, uh, if you look back. Uh, uh, our history uh, as Europe, we know very much that there were governments which uh, implemented demographic policies, uh, uh, not because of uh, they were inspired by uh, democratic values. 
and it's true, it's true. But this is not the case. And we have to stress the fact that this is not the case for many reasons, uh, at least three maybe. First of all, uh, we refer to demography in order to better understand how demographic policies can uh, uh, impact uh, on uh, the common good and not to prevail on other countries. This is the first difference, very important difference. Secondly, we are against any obligation to generate new lives, but rather we support the freedom of those who want to generate new lives, removing the actual obstacles and awarding them. So no obligation, no privilege, but a word, because having a family and generating new lives are uh, mean taking on responsibility. So we want to stress the function of the family as a resource, not as uh, the sick to be cared, but the care for the sickness. Thirdly, we are against any dirigist politics. So according to the subsidiary principle, we are in favor of a bottom-up approach, which include public institutions, politics, and civil society, like, for example, our organization. Moreover, we must overcome other, another cliche Having children is uh, not against the environmental and the sustainable development. It is the contrary. The consumerism is against any green approach. On the other hand, as Pope Francis says, uh, even in Laudato Si, no sustainable development is possible without intergenerational solidarity and balance. We hope to be a stimulus for you and please be a stimulus within the European institution. It is not enough to take care of demographic or the demographic transition. It's not enough because if you look at for example, to the documents of uh, issued by, for example, European Commission. They, they, we have the Vice President, uh, Madame Schuitzer. She, she is very good and she is very open. But we see how hard it is for her to speak about not only the demographic transition. This is a very crucial point. We have to support. Madame Schuitzer, because otherwise she cannot uh, really afford this uh, very big uh, uh, task. The task to speak about how to invert this demographic uh, winter. No future for Europe, uh, even for economic reasons. Mr. President Weber said very clearly that we are losing uh, workers. And as Italian, I know very much how heavy our uh, economic, public economic uh, situation is for uh, deficit, uh, public debt, uh, and also risk of uh, inflation. We know that. But for sure, uh, without intergenerational balance, uh, we cannot respect the master criteria. So, if we are very much uh, engaged in uh, uh, let our countries respect the master criteria, one of the first, uh, uh, let's say, worries that we have uh, to have is uh, to uh, do our best uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, maintaining, reaching and maintaining the international uh, uh, balance. And, uh, I want I go to to close to finish my uh, little uh, introduction uh, just saying what we can do because I know it's difficult it's difficult it's not easy because we said no obligation just a word so everything that we can understand it 
We can perceive what I'm saying, but it's difficult to find the right measures. So let's reason together. And what I can notice is maybe we have to assess that now there is a, real, a, a very big mismatching between accounting practice and the reality. And I want to explain my idea. The demographic politics cannot be considered as a, a public expenditures, as a cost, but they must be considered as an investment, as well as an investment in infrastructures, in educations, in, in, in green uh, uh, in sustainable uh, um, um, devices. We have to consider even the demographic policies as an investment, eh? investments which uh, have uh, uh, no impact on the deficit. They, they have, of course, uh, impact on the, the public debt, but not on the deficit, because it can change the life of our countries. I speak as Italian, but I know that it's the same also uh, for, uh, for our for our for France for every country, if you look at this uh, policy, if you regard this policy as uh, cost, um, it's difficult. But when we talk about uh, demographic policies, uh, we have uh, to think about uh, economic policies, not only social policies. It depends, of, of course, but what we are saying now is that the demographic winter is an enemy for the future of Europe. And if you want to go on, speaking about the future of Europe, we have to invest in the new generation. And we cannot, we cannot interpret the investment only for uh, uh, social, uh, in the social fields, but also in the accounting fields. So please, I don't know how, but let's cooperate together in order to, to put this kind of, uh, of expenditure within the investments which do not have any impact on deficit. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, President, and, and uh, uh, thank you very much. And I think that uh, to, to keep the uh, demographic policies as the investment and not the cost, I think it's something that which we, uh, we will use probably in our debates in uh, uh, the future of Europe. So I think it's very, very, very clear, clear message. And now uh, we will go to the exchange of views of the uh, colleagues uh, uh, from the parliament, but also from the uh, federation. And uh, I would like to remind you, uh, uh, looking at the, at, at the clock, so that uh, uh, please, if you can keep from five to seven minutes it will be the best because if not, we will not manage to the end. Okay, let's go. Um, first, uh, our uh, president, our vice president of the European Parliament, responsible for the Parliament's dialogue with churches, religious, and non confessional organization. I mean, this is the Article 17, Roberta Mezzola. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you, uh, Georgi, always for organizing such a, a great uh, exchange of views. Nice to see you here. Thanks. Manfred and also thanks to Fafse, we had already the occasion to meet uh, and exchange uh, some views and I'm really happy to be able to, to contribute here uh, today. Also, uh, because this discussion that we have in the context of the Conference on the Future of Europe is all the more essential. Manfred already gave a few statistics, I'll, I'll sort of try to expand from my end as well, uh, to give an idea of the figures we are talking about by 2070. 30% of the population is projected to be aged 65 years or older when compared to just over 20% in 2019, and 13% is projected to be 80 years or older compared to almost 6% in 2019. Now, how do we address it? Vincenzo, you just gave us some ideas, but there is no one size fits all approach. Um, policymaking needs to zoom into the reality on the ground. The European Union, Member states and regions have a shared interest in responding to a demographic change for the benefit of all Europeans. Because ultimately, when we're talking about demographic change, this will affect everyone. And it will also be a factor that has to help 
steer uh, Europe's uh, recovery from the crisis and provide us with insights as we struggle, let me use that word with responsibility, to build a more resilient, sustainable and fair union. Now, the competences for dealing with the effects of Europe's aging population are for the most part in the hands of member states, with the union placed to identify the key issues and support action on aging. It can help member states and regions develop their own specific uh, policy, responses, uh, policy responses and, uh, and our uh, aging populations. But this is ultimately about ensuring that no region and no person is left behind. Uh, this is a feeling which can ultimately lead to a loss in the fate of, of our democracy. And this is why um, Dubravka Suica has, for the first time, is the first vice president that has ever been created in that position for democracy and demography and why this subject specifically will feature in the conference on the future of Europe. It was also why this parliament uh, and with the colleagues here who I look forward to also hearing from uh, will put this higher and we have to put this higher on our agenda. So the impact of demographic aging on the labor market is becoming more pronounced and the EU's 27 working age population has been shrinking uh, for a decade and is projected to fall by 18% uh, by 2070. On the greening front, uh, as cities become more crowded, urban areas will have to continue to step up their efforts towards carving out green spaces, which can also act as carbon sinks that would help us to remove emissions from the atmosphere. This uh, importance of green spaces was also highlighted by the COVID pandemic uh, with people all over Europe who have been asking and calling for more access to green areas because rural areas are abundant in land and enjoy a lower cost of living and low levels of air pollution. At the same time, however, if we look uh, as a snapshot, they also face a number of challenges, in particular in ensuring good access to public and private services, and it generally becomes harder to attract new investment. So our cause of concern is also the decreasing number of young people that remain uh, living in our rural areas. And this issue of generational renewal is of particular concern uh, for our agricultural sector. So the need to prioritize renewal amongst our agricultural community has made all the mock stark the calls for greater autonomy and resilience in the farm to fork strategy, one of the key components of the European uh, Green Deal. Now, as Pafse has rightly pointed out, family friendly policies will shape the future of Europe. We must also assure parents that they will be able to have an effective work life balance through the right to paid leave, to flexible working arrangements, and the access to affordable childcare. And this issue of childcare also highlight the support that the grandparents often play, a role that all too often is not recognized in our policy making. I'm coming to an end, uh, Chair. Last month, uh, Pope Francis delivered an, an inspiring address that marked the opening of the Stati Generale della Natalità in Italy, uh, which struck me. His Holiness highlighted the stark reality that many young people do not believe that they can have as many children as they would like to have. And the Pope confronted uh, the participants who were attending uh, by saying, there are many other people here with you. Above all, there are the young people who dream. Uh, the data says that most young people want to have children, but their dreams of life, buds of rebirth for the country clash with a demographic winter that is still cold and dark, as was mentioned. Only half of young people believe that they will be able to have two children in their lifetime. And I think his Holy Father's statement stands out, I think, as a revolutionary contribution uh, to the ongoing discussions about the future of Europe. And policy makers and leaders across every sector often speak about sustainability. The Pope says, but we also need to talk about generational sustainability. We will not be able to nurture production and preserve the environment if we do not pay attention to families and children. Sustainable growth comes from here. History teaches us this. And my final word, he says, sustainability needs a soul, and this soul is solidarity. 
So I agree the future rests in the hands of families and we as 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 the EPP group, I mean, as we have heard, uh, are are your partner in ensuring this uh, in all our political work. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Anne. Thank you, thank you, President. Uh, and uh, now I would like to give the floor to my colleague François Xavier Bellamy, which I I, I don't know how inter to introduce because he is the politician who is a philosopher, or if he is philosopher who is a politician. Uh, I always say the, the problem, but fortunately he is both. So, so uh, François, uh, c'est à toi, uh, 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 oui, s'il vous plaît. Thank you so much, Yen, and thank you, Georgi, for uh, organizing this, uh, this event with all our friends from different associations all across Europe. And now, if I may, I will turn to French so that the cultural diversity can also live a little bit in the European debate. Merci infiniment. C'est vraiment une grande joie de pouvoir partager cette, cette réflexion. Et je, je ne vais pas être long parce que le plus important, c'est que nous puissions écouter tous ceux qui, à travers toutes les associations qui composent la, la FAFC, et je vois notamment que les AFC sont, sont bien représentés avec nous, je, je sais que c'est d'abord eux que nous devons écouter pour pouvoir orienter au mieux notre travail au sein du, du Parlement européen. Euh, je, je, je ne reviens pas sur les chiffres que Roberta a, a exposés avec euh, beaucoup de, de précision et qui montrent bien l'ampleur de la crise que nous sommes en train de, de traverser. Cette crise, elle représente un problème majeur, comme l'a comme si bien dit notre, notre président, et cher Manfred, je, je rejoins parfaitement ce que tu disais à l'instant. Euh, au fond, nous voyons bien que euh, derrière la fragilité des familles, il y a des enjeux politiques considérables pour notre avenir, des enjeux stratégiques pour l'avenir de l'Europe, parce qu'une population qui décroît, c'est évidemment des problèmes économiques et sociaux majeurs. Euh, c'est une grande difficulté à faire face à toutes les questions concrètes de la vie d'une société prospère. Et, et nous savons très bien ce que cette fragilité, cet hiver démographique représente déjà de tensions pour les modèles sociaux de beaucoup de, de pays européens. Mais je voudrais revenir peut-être sur euh, la dimension philosophique, justement, du problème auquel nous sommes confrontés aujourd'hui. Il ne s'agit pas seulement d'une question économique ou d'une question sociale. Il s'agit de cette pierre d'angle de nos sociétés qu'est la famille et dont la fragilité représente une crise pour nos pays en tant que tels. C'est un problème politique majeur, celui auquel Zygmunt Bauman faisait référence très grand sociologue d'origine polonaise qui a travaillé une grande partie de, de sa vie aux États-Unis et qui observait ce qu'il appelait la société liquide, c'est-à-dire ce modèle d'atomisation des sociétés occidentales euh, par lequel une sorte d'individualisme réduit les personnes à la solitude d'un parcours qui ne se construit plus autour de liens solides dans des engagements durables, mais qui, d'une certaine façon, se... se euh, se, se, se retrouve euh, condamné à une espèce de solitude euh, ontologique, y compris dans leurs euh, dans leur, euh, leur liens humains. Euh, nous le savons, au fond, la, la fragilisation des familles est liée à cette euh, fragilité de l'attention que nous portons à la famille, de l'attention que nous portons à ces liens. Nous sommes très concentrés autour de la question des droits, des minorités, Manfred le disait tout à l'heure, et bien sûr, ce sont des questions importantes, mais nous ne parlons pas assez du fait que la vie humaine s'accomplit dans la manière dont elle se lie par des devoirs qui nous unissent euh, d'une manière indélébile, devoir des parents envers les enfants, devoir des époux les uns entre les autres. Au fond, euh, le mariage, la famille, ce, ce n'est qu'une aventure de devoir, mais qui nous fait sortir de la solitude, qui nous oblige à prendre en considération dans notre propre vie personnelle le bien d'autres êtres que nous. Et c'est par là même que nos vies peuvent s'ouvrir à une dimension qui les dépasse et qu'elles peuvent ainsi s'accomplir. Le, le grand mystère, ce que, ce que manque l'individualisme contemporain, c'est que c'est à travers ces liens, c'est à travers ces engagements, c'est à travers ce qu'il représente de contraintes et de coûts, d'une certaine manière, vu du point de vue de l'individu, que se construit quelque chose qui nous grandit et qui nous permet de nous rencontrer et de devenir nous-mêmes. Au fond, nous le savons bien, c'est le grand paradoxe dans lequel 
euh, s'inscrivent nos existences et pour lequel il nous faut lutter. Et je crois que la présence du pape François à cet événement sur euh, l'hiver démographique avait précisément cette signification que, euh, au fond, le message spirituel du pape, c'est celui euh, qui consiste à parler de l'homme comme un être de lien, euh, comme un être qui s'accomplit dans les liens qu'il qu s'est créé. Nous ne vivons pas dans, dans une période d'égoïsme, euh, nous ne vivons pas dans une période d'où la générosité aurait disparu. Et les hommes et les femmes ne sont certainement pas moins généreux aujourd'hui euh, qu'ils ne l'étaient par le passé. Mais nous vivons dans un monde individualiste, ce qui est assez différent. C'est une représentation de l'existence comme concentrée autour de l'individu. Et cette perspective atomiste, cette perspective qui isole, euh, qui conduit à cette liquéfaction de nos sociétés, qui empêche de créer des liens qui durent, cette perspective-là, pour le coup, elle conduit à un problème politique majeur qui est la fracturation de tous les autres liens que la société sait construire. Dans, dans, dans la contre-démocratie, Pierre Rosanvallon, qui est un philosophe, un intellectuel français, montrait que les liens de confiance sont forcément globaux. Et lorsqu'on n'a plus confiance dans personne, dans son entourage proche, on ne peut plus faire confiance dans les institutions, on n'a plus confiance dans la politique, on n'a plus confiance dans son pays, on n'a plus confiance dans l'avenir. Euh, et cet apprentissage de la confiance, il se construit d'abord par les liens les plus proches, les plus immédiats. Euh, il y a une corrélation étroite entre euh, la montée de la défiance et de la solitude euh, à l'échelle individuelle et la montée de la défiance envers les institutions, de cette défiance auquel il nous faut faire face, y compris dans, dans l'expérience politique aujourd'hui. Nous ne pourrons pas reconstruire la confiance dans nos sociétés, l'unité de nos sociétés, si nous ne savons pas d'abord reconstruire cette unité fondamentale qu'est l'unité de la famille, le sens de ces liens qui, qui durent, le sens de ces attachements qui marquent une existence et dont nous le savons bien. Nos contemporains aspirent encore à vivre euh, une expérience vraiment pleine. Pour cela, encore faut-il les y aider. C'est la raison pour laquelle notre rôle, je crois, de responsable politique, c'est de, de recréer les conditions pour le choix de la famille les conditions sociales, les conditions économiques, les conditions matérielles. Aujourd'hui, nous le voyons bien, dans beaucoup de pays d'Europe, il devient difficile de faire vivre une famille avec euh, euh, les conditions salariales existantes. Nous ne pensons plus assez à cette dimension du, du foyer et la nécessité de garantir, comme le disait euh, Vincenzo Bassi, que euh, cet investissement indispensable pour notre avenir soit porté par des parents qui s'engagent auprès de leurs enfants. Euh, ceci représente, je crois, un, un devoir que nous avons comme responsables politiques. Et puis, nous devons aussi reconstruire les, dire, les conditions intellectuelles et presque les conditions spirituelles pour que cet engagement soit de nouveau respecté, estimé, soit de nouveau pleinement partagé. Et ça, c'est aussi peut-être le rôle particulier de notre famille politique comme héritière de la, de la démocratie chrétienne, c'est sur quoi, avec notre président, nous avons eu l'occasion de, de travailler longuement. Pardonnez-moi d'avoir été un peu trop long, mais tout ça pour vous dire que je crois que le sujet que vous portez est fondamental, il est central pour notre avenir, et je ne peux que vous remercier encore infiniment d'ouvrir cette conversation et de nous y avoir invités. Merci encore. Oui, oui, euh, <coughs> comme vous voyez, je vais raison que c'est le politi qu l'homme politique, qui est le philosophe ou le philosophe qui est en politique. Ok, merci euh, François-Xavier. Je crois que c'est la notion de solitude et on est confiance. Ce n'est pas le langage technique et économique, c'est quelque chose de beaucoup plus profond. Et, uh, et before giving the floor to our next speaker, I must say that because we promised to have uh, one, uh, one hour, so um, uh, uh, I, I understand that our, our chairman, Weber, in his very busy plan, found one hour. So I really, very, we are very grateful. But I think uh, 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 that probably, probably he will have to leave us after this one hour. So Manfred, I would like to thank you very much for your presence. And of course, the, uh, uh, I will do it now because probably the moment you will have to leave, you will just leave. So thank you once again. And now, um, uh, Georg Holveni, uh, our Vice President of the Working Group. Georg, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks uh, to, to your all and many thanks that you, Manfred, you spent a lot of time and to show you the importance of this uh, topic. So the colleagues, honestly, I wrote my speech, you know, that is it's more concentrated, yeah, you know, it's uh, not to speak, but, and I will be uh, very direct, very polite. I hope it's, I will be polite as well, uh, and a little bit provocative as well, to myself, not to you, to myself as well. Um, and uh, my speech will have some similarities to the, uh, the speech for Roberta and uh, François Javier and uh, Manfred as well 
yeah, that we are politicians, the text that, that we are more or less on the same line, you know, we, we see the importance. And my point of view is really demography and support of the next generation are the very few fundamental pillars of, uh, if we're talking about European way of life. Without that, the self-centered, egoistic society would emerge, the focus, the focus is only uh, on consumption with, uh, without a real vision. And I am convinced that one of the tasks uh, of the mission of the EPP is uh, the nurture of definition of family, to find the right language in the 21st century, find the definition of for the future, which must be elevated about the daily political debate a little bit, if it's possible. We may remain, in, uh, we may remain currently minority, but if we are good enough, uh, with good messages and good work, yeah, uh, I believe we need to be as uh, united as possible. At this united, this need uh, compromises. We must plan for the future. Family matters have strategic importance because power for families are key elements of upholding of the economy. It was mentioned already, and this uh, what uh, we also highlighted the future of the. Uh, Christian democracy uh, position paper. Yeah, it was signed by all uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Mr. Bellamy. Quoted: There is no policy that lays uh, that lays the ground. George, George, we, we lost you. I don't know if. Uh... At least me, I lost you. So I think that for the reaction of the others, if you lost, can you refresh, please? Sorry, but this is, I think, what uh, President Vincenzo Bassi hates, is this kind of situation that we, uh, uh, from time to time, we have the technical problems, so our relations are, are broken. So um, uh, let me wait a little bit for, because I don't want to lose the continuity of this of speech of uh, Georg Holveni. Yes, uh, uh, I'm trying to call uh, Jörg uh, and he's not responding, so maybe he, he lost the connection. So I think that uh, if you, you don't mind, we will be back with Jörg uh, when he is um, uh, reconnected. And I now give the, the, the floor to, to our colleague, uh, Carlo, Carlo Ressel from Croatia. Carlo, um, so, sorry for this kind of order, but... Uh, I hope that it will work. So, Carlo, the floor is yours. No worries, Jan. I'm uh, sorry to interrupt uh, Georgi, but uh, he can then uh, continue uh, after. And thank you also really to Manfred for the participation, for the time, uh, to Nicola, uh, but also to Signor Bossi. 
and uh, to all of you uh, colleagues uh, on this really uh, important topic and um, one of the I would really say most neglected uh, big issues that is really essential for the for the future of Europe. I uh, totally agree that uh, the issue of facing demographic challenges is uh, much broader, but in a sense also uh, much deeper than uh, just thinking about the necessary social and economic uh, policies. And I think that in this uh, format, uh, in this forum, we can really speak uh, uh, quite openly and agree that uh, it also certainly consists of uh, looking at the family as the foundation uh, of society and uh, as an inherently ir irreplaceable uh, value. So uh, from that uh, point of view, uh, to solve uh, demographic problems, uh, we must uh, certainly recognize that the, the family is, is the foundation of uh, Europe's value system and also try to uh, put uh, family uh, back uh, as a part of the mainstream uh, culture in Europe. And that is unfortunately not the trend that we see now. Uh, in addition, it is obviously also important to work on adequate uh, social and economic requirements uh, that they are met in the policies that uh, we advocate. But I would really say that this uh, deeper and broader view uh, should be a, a precondition for, for all the other uh, policies. And especially uh, in the phase in which uh, Europe encounters uh, a significant paradox and that um, in a sense that although we have uh, never been wealthier on average, uh, demographics have uh, never been uh, the worse. And this uh, clearly shows that uh, the economic growth is not the only parameter that we should uh, take care of, uh, although uh, this is uh, important as well. In that sense, uh, there is also an interesting uh, observation by uh, Pope Francis in which he states uh, that countries with uh, declining birth rates are rich in resources, but uh, poor in hope. And uh, the today's uh, culture of, uh, of fear for the future, but also I mean, culture of uh, consumerism. Giorgi, I'm uh, sorry that uh, I interrupted you. But uh, yeah, hopefully you're back now. But I, I think that the, today is a culture of uh, fear for the future and also with the culture of uh, consumerism is really um, and the component that is really uh, shaping the, the current situation that, that also has to be taken into account when we are dealing with uh, the demographic uh, issues. But um, in a continent that is aging and uh, in the continent where our lives are also longer, we as uh, policymakers uh, need to ensure that uh, they are uh, that these longer ages are spent well and uh, quality uh, in in good health. As a society, um, among dealing with uh, our core values, we must uh, create uh, appropriate social uh, preconditions for strengthening uh, family life. And uh, it is especially important to, to fortify the, the position and the status of parents uh, through the further development also of the legislative framework in the labor market field, and especially taking care of uh, work-life balance, uh, but also in terms of uh, specific programs to, uh, to really allow everyone who wants to have uh, children to have them. Um, I think that um, in, in this context, it is also important to note that um, social transfers and um, investments uh, in care throughout Europe, but uh, throughout the Western civilization are mostly focused uh, on elderly and that the, the investment in elderly is uh, much more institutionalized uh, in comparison uh, to the investment uh, in children and that the share that the burden of really raising children is uh, much less uh, on, on on the society as a whole but is really uh, unproportionally on on a family uh, although this is really investment and the whole society in the end benefits uh, from 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 the children um, I uh, really firmly believe that uh, this debate on, uh, on demographic uh, policies uh, must not be uh, only reduced also to the problem of care for the elderly. Also, this is an important part, but 
also uh, how to include um, the elderly as an active part and contributor uh, to our society. In that sense, uh, our mission also uh, as, uh, as members of the younger generations is uh, to provide an age-friendly uh, environment when really everyone can contribute uh, to society with uh, their knowledge and with their uh, experience. Uh, to try to go towards the end, I would uh, still want to um, recognize that Europe has at least a declaratory uh, in the past few years, and especially with the uh, foundation of the, of the new portfolio, also in the commission in this area. And we are really proud uh, in this regard with, uh, with Dubarka Schuitz and with uh, this position that Europe has really um, recognized uh, this as a problem. But I would say that we are now in the pioneering stage of really creating the foundations and creating the, the legal framework, creating also the institutionalized and uh, uh, financial uh, framework in, in really establishing uh, what I would call as a really comprehensive uh, demographic um, aspect of, of all the European politics uh, policies. And uh, in this sense, I think that the cohesion policy is one of the policies which um, cannot ignore and neglect the demographic trends, uh, especially. And in this regard, I think that the, the possibilities uh, for developing the, the legislative framework and legislative basis is really uh, the most uh, promising. But um, as we already mentioned in, in the previous speeches as well, um, the demographic balances um, that do exist in Europe um, are different from the demographic imbalances also in, in the countries that uh, try to neglect the free will of its population. We see now the changes in the uh, Chinese uh, population strategies and uh, the huge mistakes that were that are now recognized and that were part of the official uh, Chinese policy. And I think that we should never really uh, repeat uh, that kind of mistake, uh, reg regardless of the of the position. And in the end, we really have to have that uh, free will of, of the people, but in a way, really try to support families in um, any possible way, uh, especially in childbearing. Uh, because it is an investment for the whole society. And secondly, uh, to allow the parents and to allow the families to have as many children as they would like. This is my uh, little contribution. I really thank you for, uh, for your participation. I thank to FAFSE and to our uh, continuous discussion and debate on this, but also to the support to Dubarka uh, Shuica and to our endeavors uh, in the parliament to have this uh, topic high on the agenda and to really develop uh, sustainable and comprehensive uh, policy for the future. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Carla. And because we have uh, Georg again with us, so Georg, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Sorry, that's um, uh, that's, that should be technically the most uh, sacred uh, place, the parliament, but it's uh, not in every case, but I hope it's okay. So I, 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 I provocated myself about the possible EPP mission to find a way, uh, uh, find a way to make uh, family as a lifestyle important, uh, to make important for the young people. And the, as a positive experience, we should replace the fear with hope and, uh, uh, and really partly responsibility, hope and responsibility. To change the exist existing tendencies, we need to introduce the family-friendly approach in our society. For this, the civil society, family organization, voila. So churches, academic and economic stakeholders should be involved. The coordination, only the coordination of what well, are the point of my view, the responsibility real of the state. The creation of the welfare society, fulfillment uh, of the individualism, is, uh, is individualism uh, has weakened the cohesive power of the family. Uh, it is in my life, and I think it's one of the greatest uh, contradiction of the European society uh, that prosperity weakens the family. Uh, it must be clearly pointed out that, of course, the family has a material, 
financial consequences, but the family itself, regardless of the material issues, either the uh, replaceable sociological, social psychological form, the social integration of the upcoming generation is form of the merge from the beginning of the human life that needs to be highlighted in the different form, in the different language, and should be the basic uh, basis of the maintaining 21st century lifestyle that is attractive to the young people behind the financial means. Um, sorry, that's for the example, but it's you will understand in my country in Hungary that uh, there has been a real family friendly policy uh, almost for 10 years, and which had to introduce in the country uh, with the birth rate and the 20, 1.25, it was the lowest in Europe. And after uh, 10 years, it seems that very long uh, predictable program is needed. Predictable program is needed to create a credible alternative uh, for previous, um, uh, previous trends. Uh, as, uh, the state has serious limitations. There it is limitation. It can actually only provide an expanded organizatorical and financial uh, framework. But today is the safe to say that thanks to the cost of the family, uh, family friendly measures and investments, uh, such as reduced taxes, home construction programs, easier access to interfertility treatment of free meals for children, situation has significantly improved. But this is a really, very really long-term problem as has uh, politically united uh, on it. This is a structural solidarity. It was mentioned already, but I would like to repeat it. What Pope Francis underlined his speech in the meeting of the general states of birth in Italy. Stability should be provided to the structure supporting families and helping uh, the birth race. This requires policies, economics, information, and culture that promote uh, the childbirth. This is how we can prepare really for tomorrow. And the point of my view, to address the democratic challenges, the man and woman nature and complementarity should be protected. It's not against other style of the other form of lifestyle as they are the mother and the father by nature and marriage is their commitment. It's not, uh, not a fight, it's not a, uh, not a, but it should be noted that marriage and family are already reserved terms for the thousand years of the, of the nature of, their, of the European uh, majority. Uh, if we want, and this is really the last uh, things on my side, if we want future for Europe, it is really it our job in the European Parliament to set the positive examples, uh, uh, protect families and pursue the good social and economic policies. And really it's maybe it's a naive approach, but help the uh, member state to rely on the EPP mission and realize uh, the EPP vision of the culture of life. We need culture of life and culture of family for the next generation. That's his own mission, I think so. So many thanks to you, many thanks. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to, uh, uh, to a distinguished uh, representative of the uh, uh, Federation of Catholic Family. First, uh, uh, Monsieur Antoine Renard, the uh, Honorary President of the Federation of Catholic Family Association in Europe. C'est à vous. It's up to you. It depends. Merci beaucoup. Je vais m'exprimer en français, si vous le permettez. Pas de lendemain sans poussette, pas d'avenir sans berceau. Toute société qui s'interroge sur son avenir est conduite à s'intéresser à ses enfants. Même la Chine s'en préoccupe puisqu'elle vient d'autoriser le troisième enfant. Et l'Europe, qui s'apprête à ouvrir le débat sur son futur, reconnaît avec retard et une certaine timidité qu'elle n'en fait plus assez, et ce depuis longtemps. Mais enfin, cinq ans après le cri d'alarme de la Fondation Robert Schuman, qui titrait « Hiver démographique en Europe, un suicide collectif », le sujet n'est plus tabou et la Commission européenne s'est dotée d'une vice-présidence à la démocratie et à la démographie. Je voudrais souligner rapidement quatre points, déjà plus ou moins évoqués. Le premier, c'est la grande contradiction entre le rêve et la réalité. Toutes les enquêtes montrent que la première aspiration des jeunes 
bien au-delà de la réussite professionnelle, de l'enrichissement, de monter sa start-up, c'est de trouver l'âme sœur, de fonder une famille et d'élever dignement des enfants. Mais ils ne le font pas. Et les chiffres sont là. Baisse du mariage, baisse de l'âge, retard à l'âge du mariage, taux de fertilité moyen en dessous du seuil de renouvellement et en baisse continue dans chacun de nos pays. Les gens ne font pas ce qu'ils aimeraient faire. Et le résultat est connu. En 2019, dans l'Union européenne, 4,2 millions de naissances contre 4,7 millions de décès. La chute a commencé en 2010. Et le nombre ahurissant d'avortements, 1 million pour toute l'Union européenne, dont 220 000 en France, évidemment aggrave les choses. Or, en matière de démographie, les prévisions sont bien plus vraies que dans n'importe quel autre domaine. Les enfants qui ne naissent pas aujourd'hui n'auront pas 40 ans dans 40 ans, et cela manqueront. Quand on dit qu'en 2050, 80% des Italiens n'auront pas l'expérience de ce que sont un frère, une sœur, un cousin ou une cousine, ce n'est pas une prévision. C'est le résultat immanquable de trois générations d'enfants uniques. Mon second point, c'est qu'avant d'être un problème économique, social, d'organisation, qui peut se régler Cette baisse de la démographie est d'abord un signal adressé par les peuples d'Europe à leurs dirigeants et à leurs élites. L'avenir qu'ils proposent n'apparaît pas désirable. Enfanter est un acte de confiance et de foi en l'avenir. Comme l'avait déjà déclaré le pape au Parlement européen, l'Europe apparaît vieillie, comme l'as de son histoire. Les jeunes n'osent pas se lancer dans l'aventure parce qu'ils ont peur du chômage, du déclassement, de ne pas tenir, de ne pas, de ne pas être soutenu. Le désenchantement du monde est la vraie cause de cette démographie suicidaire. Il a atteint même les grands pays de tradition catholique. Troisième point, qu'on le veuille ou non, ce sont les familles qui font des enfants. Or, les familles, elles ont besoin d'un toit, problème de la politique du logement. Elles ont besoin d'un travail, problème de la politique de l'emploi. Elles ont besoin de temps en famille, problème de l'équilibre entre la vie professionnelle et la vie familiale. Et elles ont besoin d'un environnement sain, problème de politique économique, de politique sanitaire, de politique de l'écologie, de la consommation et de l'écologie intégrale. Ce quatrième point sur l'écologie, ce troisième point sur l'environnement le, le, m'amène à un quatrième, c'est que dans l'environnement, il faut aussi entendre l'environnement culturel et l'ouverture à la transcendance. Le détournement des droits de l'homme, autrefois respecté pour sa dignité intrinsèque, au profit de l'individualisme sans limite, la promotion de la sexualité vue comme une fin en soi, la marchandisation et la financiarisation de toute activité humaine, et maintenant le terrorisme écologique, si on peut dire, allié à une déchristianisation croissante, met à mal l'anthropologie qui en Europe a produit des trésors culturels et artistiques. Et elle étouffe en l'homme ses aspirations les plus grandes, son besoin congénital, vital, de se donner, d'aimer et d'être aimé. S'il ne croit à rien, disait Victor Hugo, l'homme cesse de vivre. En écho, le pape, dans ce discours en Italie, déjà puissamment cité, répond « une société qui n'accueille pas la vie cesse de vivre ». Mais heureusement, comme le remarquait Nicolas Speranza en début de ce colloque, <coughs> si les familles repartent, tout repart. Mesdames et messieurs les élus, merci d'aider à faire repartir les familles d'Europe pour le bien de tous. Faites leur confiance, elles vous le rendront bien. En écoutant les parlementaires du Parti populaire européen, j'ai confiance. Merci beaucoup. Oui, euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, je crois c'est de, de montrer que sur les problèmes horizontaux, c'est la politique démographique, 
c'est horizontal pour toutes les politiques. Alors, je crois que c'est vraiment très important pour nous. Et maintenant, je voudrais aussi donner la parole à Mme Pascal Morinière, euh, présidente de, de Nash, euh, non, euh, euh, et la Confédération des catholiques, euh, euh, les familles catholiques nationales France. Oui, c'est à vous. We don't, we don't hear you. If you can unmute. Le micro. OK. Euh, Excusez-moi. En France, la question de la natalité a longtemps été un sujet de satisfaction puisque nous avons de longue date un taux de fécondité record par rapport aux autres pays européens. Et nous imputions cela à une politique familiale particulièrement ambitieuse, mais sans avoir la preuve de la corrélation avec la natalité. Évoquer des politiques natalistes a longtemps été peu audible dans le débat public, puisque d'une part le contexte ne s'y prêtait pas, et que d'autre part cela évoquait des politiques suspectes d'aller contre les libertés individuelles. À partir de 2013, sous le gouvernement Hollande, de nombreuses mesures anti-famille ont été prises, concernant la fiscalité des familles ou les congés parentaux. Et aussitôt après, dès 2014, l'indice de fécondité a commencé à diminuer. Or, nous étions auparavant sur un plateau autour de deux enfants par femme, presque au seuil de renouvellement des, des générations, à 2,1 enfants par femme, et ce depuis 2006. Alors, depuis 2014, l'indice de fécondité diminue chaque année. Il est descendu à 1,83 enfants par femme en 2019. Dans le même temps, les Français souhaitent toujours autant d'enfants. Ils ont été interrogés en 2011 et en 2021, et les réponses ont été les mêmes à 10 ans d'écart. Les Français souhaitent exactement 2,39 enfants. Entre le nombre d'enfants souhaités et l'indice de fécondité, 2,39 moins 1,83, il y a 0,56 points. Les Français auraient donc volontiers un demi-enfant de plus ou bien une famille sur deux aurait un enfant de plus si chacun accueillait le nombre d'enfants souhaités. Alors de 1994 à 2006, la fécondité avait augmenté grâce à de nombreuses mesures pro-famille. L'inverse s'est produit à partir de 2014 lorsque ces mesures ont été rabotées. La politique familiale a donc un véritable impact sur l'accueil des enfants. Nous sommes toujours en tête de la natalité européenne, mais nous prenons conscience que nous devons nous aussi nous préoccuper sérieusement de ce sujet. Notre haut commissaire au plan, François Bayrou, vient de publier il y a dix jours un rapport qui propose d'adopter un pacte national pour la démographie, comprenant des mesures fortes de politique familiale dans trois grands domaines, les congés accordés aux parents, les prestations familiales et l'accompagnement de la petite enfance. Nous nous réjouissons de cette parole publique sur un sujet jusqu'alors désinvesti par les responsables politiques. Cette prise de position est motivée par notre système social français qui repose sur un modèle de société où tous contribuent pour chacun. Cela concerne bien entendu notre système de retraite par répartition, mais aussi l'éducation, la santé, la solidarité, l'assurance, notamment en matière de chômage. Tout cela relève en fait d'un principe de répartition de la charge et du risque sur l'ensemble de la population active. Pour nous, AFC, nous préconisons un certain nombre de mesures présentées il y a quelques jours au secrétariat d'État aux familles et à l'enfance afin de soutenir la, la natalité. Les grands principes en sont les suivants. Premièrement, différencier la politique familiale qui doit être universelle afin de soutenir les couples qui font l'effort de mettre au monde les enfants, enfants qui contribueront demain à la solidarité nationale, et différencier cela de la politique sociale qui vise à lutter contre les inégalités. Et deuxièmement, développer des politiques globales, cohérentes, pérennes et lisibles. La volonté de prendre en compte la natalité, si elle est motivée par des préoccupations économiques, doit aussi être motivée par l'état d'esprit général que génère une fécondité dynamique. Le pape François l'a exprimé lors des états généraux de la natalité italien, les enfants sont l'espoir qui fait renaître un peuple. Autrement dit, il existe un cercle vertueux entre l'optimisme, voire l'espérance d'une société et sa natalité. 
Notre vieux continent a un besoin urgent de croire en lui-même et avoir confiance en son avenir en mettant au monde et en s'engageant généreusement pour de nouvelles générations. Alors nous espérons que ce premier rapport sera suivi des faits, en particulier à l'occasion des élections présidentielles et législatives de 2022. Je vous remercie. Merci, uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, uh, I would just draw your attention to the uh, remarks, comments, and questions who are on the Q&A. Uh, I don't think that we will have a chance to reopen the debate uh, because we don't have time to do it, but I think there are very important remarks and, 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 the, uh, and observations on the Q&A. So, um, uh, uh, we have now about uh, 13 minutes to finish our meeting, but uh, uh, because we have still uh, uh, two uh, persons for the conclusions, but I think that I would, I would like to propose you is to prolong a little bit, but without translation, okay? Because the translation will finish at six sharp, 6 p.m. So if we have to, if we can prolong a little bit, it will be in English, okay? Let's, let's agree in English. I understand that the French colleagues will prefer to let's agree on French, but you know, which is of course the best language in the world, but let's, let's do it in English because Brexit should be balanced with our, our debates. So, okay, let's go in English. Uh, I, I have the, uh, now, uh, uh, we call it conclusions, but of course this is the, also the possibility to take the floor for the very important colleagues. Uh, I would like to now to introduce Miriam Lexman. Uh, if you want to, 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 to see someone who is fighting in the parliament for the, for the notion of family and our values, etc., uh, 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 Miriam is the person. So I think that uh, 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 before giving the floor, I must just say that, uh, uh, please remember, I'm in Poland, a beautiful weather. We have now uh, uh, for, uh, the day uh, off because this is the Corpus Christi in Poland. Unfortunately, because, the, because of the coronavirus, we don't have the processions in the streets. Normally, all the families are in the streets. I mean, the Catholic families are in the streets. Now it's empty. Now it's empty. Only the churches are partially uh, uh, full. But this is the day uh, in, in, in our country, which is very, very family day and very important. So I just want to remind because I, in many countries it's, it's Sunday. Uh, but in, my, in our country, this is the, the, the day free day off. And uh, uh, sorry for this Polish uh, element, but I think please remember <laughs> that for me, this debate is important for different reasons. It's also very probably the good day for this kind of debate. Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you very much for the inside of the Polish culture, because in Slovakia, the culture is very similar. So I would also say that the day would be different if there wasn't a pandemic today, but the weather is nice, so families at least can spend some time outside, but not grouped together and not uh, really packed in the church or, or the processions. Uh, thank you very much to my own also working group um, on intercultural and religious dialogue, and especially to Jan Olbricht and Dior Hilveni, but also thanks to Manfred Weber, who I guess that has already left us, our president, and to FAFSA, the Federation of Catholic Family Associations, for co-organizing this event, because I think it's a very timely event. Uh, the demographic challenge is not only economic challenge, but is a challenge of, I think, our civilization as such. And it's important that especially EPP is bringing up these issues and is debating these issues and trying to find solutions to these issues. Uh, as uh, uh, our Pope Francis already said, that unfortunately our continent has used to be old continent or called an old continent because of the history, because of the rich culture. But now, unfortunately, it's old because of the age. And there are a couple of drivers of, of this, uh, uh, this change of demographics, uh, some are, are positives. I mean, we have better quality of food, we have better quality of health care, so the life expectancy is much longer. But unfortunately, there are also negative drivers, and the negative drivers are economic reasons and reasons why it was already mentioned by a couple of speakers before me, uh, the reasons why young people are afraid of ha having children, and these reasons are, are different, but many of them are economic. 
I remember uh, before I joined the European Parliament, I was working for the International Republican Institute, which is American NGO working in democracies and support and, and, and uh, support of uh, freedom in the world. And we have done a research because we were looking into uh, the disinformation waves and why people trust uh, to the trust in democracy and, uh, and free society as we know it, why, why it's declining. And we were realizing that fear is one of the drivers of the lack of trust into our system as, as democracy. And we're trying to f figure out what people are fearing of. And what was very interesting that the collapse of the social system because of the demographic change was one of the fears people people felt. And it was not related, that our research was not related to family matters, but I think it also shows why people are fearing to have children because they do see that practically the, the 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 pensions schemes might not work when they will be older so they don't know what they can afford or not so they are kind of sub, i mean maybe not so much consciously but subconsciously having this fear that the, that the world will change and and their the economic uh, uh, certainties uh, the people are enjoying today will not uh, be able to join later on uh, we also, I mean, some of the statistics uh, uh, why women uh, uh, undergo abortion also show that the fear to have a second or a third child for, for economic reasons is one of the, the reasons why uh, they or their family or their partners are decide not to have a child. And I think that as the European Union is the richest continent uh, or part of the world in, in the world, it's absolutely unacceptable that among us, there are women who are going, undergoing abortion because of an economic reason, while we are realizing that the demographic decline is one of our biggest, uh, biggest um, uh, fears. And of course, the human life cannot have only economic uh, reasons, but the, it has to be combined in our policies, both of the aspects of, of, of this, uh, this decline. Uh, what COVID has shown us is practically that we have realized that family is the most important hub people have when they are fearing of something. It's the hub which is providing the shelter, which is providing education to children when they cannot go to school, which is, which is uh, providing the care for elderly when the state is failing to, prepare, to, to provide it because of the, because of the pandemics but, or other... other uh, crisis we might face also in the future. And I work most of the time in, in a foreign policy because I'm also a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And we are talking a lot about resilience there. But what we need to also bring this term into the family policy, because we need to make families resilient to the changes in our systems, changes in our, our societies, the new possible crisis which we might face in the future. So what I think that what is important is to, uh, as, as I said, look into the kind of infrastructure for the, for the families that they have access to care uh, support with the elderly or people with disabilities who are family members. We need to have uh, support for the families, uh, for the educational system, but we also need to support the families that they still play a very strong role in the educational system. And I think this is absolutely vital that we should not take the children out from the families in order to, to be educated, because we have realized that this is one of the strongest elements. Uh, what, as a person who is a member of the EMPL committee, I'm trying to look also into the justice in the social system. Because, uh, and, and this is what I have realized from a, from a kind of real practical uh, live experience that I'm a child, uh, one of four. So I have three uh, siblings, only sisters. So we have four daughters. And because my our mother has been spending time with the maternity leave with, with us when we were small, of course, her, and then she had to opt out for jobs which were not so high, I mean, with not high income, because obviously she need to have the flexibility to take care of children, pick us from school or whatever. And we have seen that this is practically the reason why many mothers of many children 
are suffering poverty when they are older because the pension scheme is actually not counting the value they spend the time for taking care of children into the pension scheme. So practically, and I think this is a great injustice that mothers with many children who provide uh, what the society needs is the future taxpayers and the, the people who will be creating the economic growth. Those mothers are suffering poverty when they become pensioners because the pension is very low, although they have given to the society the most valuable the society needs, which is the human life and, and children. The same, what I believe it's, but this is not the competence of the EU, but what the member states could think, and now uh, my, my own party is coming with policies that there are tax breaks for families, for children, that there is a higher support for, for parental and maternal leave, because we know that this is a value for the society, it's not only value for the family, but it's value for the entire society when parents take care of their children. Uh, there is a po policy that our party came up with that mothers who, who are who have school children that they can take one day a month off uh, like extra to their to their holidays uh, in order to take care of the family and help with the i don't know the doctors of the children or whatever which is very much um, welcomed by the society so th the whole infrastructure for the family should be supported because family is really the basis for 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 the future of our civilization, of our societies, of our countries, but also of the European Union. And I will finish with, um, uh, with the subsidiarity principle, as the president of FAFSA has also mentioned this principle, because uh, we are now practically celebrating 130th anniversary since the Encyclica Reru Novarum and 19th anniversary since the Encyclica Quadra Gessimo Anno, which brought the, the subsidiarity principle. And, and the principle practically recognizes family as the smallest nucleus, the smallest association, all the high associations should support to, should be subsidiary to, which means that the European Union should also serve the family because that's the kind of association all the, all the associations should serve to. And, and I, I was thinking like, why? what is the r role of the family in a society when we look at it from the political angle? And uh, for me, the family is a basis of trust and Francois Bellamy has been talking about trust as well. When trust is the basis of democracy, family is a basis of solidarity. And the, the fathers of the EU, and especially Robert Truman, was, was under, underlying the role of solidarity also as the base, main basis of the European Union. Family is a basis of responsibility, and we know the responsible citizenry is practically the key to a, to a active society and functional society. Family is the basis for education, and we know that the education plays an important role in fighting against poverty and in economic growth. And family is also the basis for social skills and critical thinking, and we know that we are facing a threat of a looming um, age of relativism, and Benedict XVI called uh, relativism as the new type of uh, totality, totality. So practically the critical thinking and social skills which are needed to fight against this are being developed in family. And that's why family is important as the basic nucleus of our society and of our civilization. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Miriam. And uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me remind you that you have a very interesting questions and uh, remarks. If, if, if some of you can can answer it on uh, uh, typing the, the answer, it will be the best because we don't have time. But I will now make the very tricky solution for the last speaker, for Mr. Ulrich Hoffman, uh, 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 who is the uh, president of the National Confederation of Catholic Organization. Uh, no, who, who is the president of Familienbund? Sorry, I don't speak German, but uh, now we have only English. But I will address to you, among the others, the, the question from Ivana Horakova from Czech Republic. Is there some idea how to motivate the young people uh, 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 as far as concerns the family life? Maybe when you're in your conclusion remarks, you can just touch this element, how it works in, in Germany. Let me remind you, this is now we are only in English. 
And the uh, final conclusion is for Mr. Ulrich Hoffmann. The floor is yours. Thank you, dear members of European Parliament, dear colleagues. I'm very glad uh, to have the occasion to make some final remarks. I'm very pleased about the previous uh, statements and the panel discussion. It shows that the demographic problem has been identified and that we are working together on a solution. In addition to many important things which have already been said, I would like to add a few thoughts. At first, a quote of one of the founding fathers of the European Union, Konrad Adenauer, first chancellor of West Germany, was once asked uh, the following question. Should the German pension insurance take into account whether a person has brought up children? His counselor recommended such a family bonus. Otherwise, there could be an economic incentive not to have children. This could, in the long run, destabilize the pension insurance in which the pensions of the elderly are paid by the younger generation. Adenauer's answer was more or less the following. A family bonus is not necessary. People will always get children. Since those ancient times, the European birth rate dropped dramatically from around 2.7 children per woman in the 1950s to around 1.6 children per woman today. In a lot of European countries, the birth rate is even lower. We can see now, it is not a law of, nat it is not a law of nature anymore that people get children, but I am convinced family and social politics can influence the birth rate and raise it again. The key issue is, what is a good family policy with a positive impact on demography? I would like to highlight three points. First, work-life balance. Second, enough time for family life. Third, fair recognition of the care work of the families. Point one, work-life balance. Many young people today want to have both, a fulfilling job and a family. Therefore, it is important that every family has the right to a childcare infrastructure of high quality. There should be quality standards which ensure that childcare centers are places of education and social learning. It is also important that the, law, uh, that the labor law gets more family friendly. There should be more flexibility for parents. Besides flexible working hours, parents should have the right to work from home and take a day off when the child spontaneously needs the parent's care. This leads to point two, enough time for family life. It is important that families have enough time together. Good, good relationships need time. Too often, Work-life balance is interpreted as a means to adapt the families to economic needs. But, the contra but on the contrary, the economy should be adapted to the needs of the families. The families should be the starting point and the center of all family policies. And since the wishes of the families are as different as the European families themselves, there should, be, there should not be a one-size-fits-all solution for all families. Instead, a legal framework should give many options to the families so that they can find their individual work-life balance. In the long term, there should be a parental leave for at, of at least one year in all European countries. Moreover, when the children are older, parents should have the right to reduce their working hours for a limited amount of time according to their wishes. This would allow them to take care good of their children in difficult times and come back to their normal working hours when the children do not need their support anymore. And of course, there should be a financial compensation for families so that families can afford to reduce their working hours to care for their families. And point three, fair rec recognition of the care work of the families. 
financial compensation for families must not be seen as social welfare. Families are not welfare recipients. They are high performers. They merit compensation for their indispensable care work. They earn it for their contribution to our social security systems and generally speaking, for their contribution to the future of our society, for upholding our values and our culture. Support for families is just and fair. It is an investment in the future. If there are structural disadvantages for families, families will get less children than they wish to have. But if there is a family friendly framework, people will realize their wishes to have children and family life in Europe will flourish again. Thank you, that's our common hope. Yes, so we have the conclusion, which is very concrete and practical. So we are coming from the concept of loneliness, loneliness and of course the trust. And we, now we show that this, this is not about to take care of families, it's to support the families, to support and to invest. So I think this is very interesting. And of course, it, it will see, of course, also the answer for, for, for this kind of question. Before my final final sentence, I'd like to, to thank the tr people who were translating because they decided to stay when you were speaking. So, so it is very kind of them. I would like to thank them because the, uh, it, it allows the, uh, many of the uh, listeners to also to follow your, your speech. Last sentence. <clears throat> I remember the moment when uh, Pope Front, uh, Francis was in Parliament. And I remember the moment when he was speaking about the European Union. And let's finish uh, on a very positive way, because when he said uh, that this is a kind of una donna, this is the uh, donna, uh, probably uh, President uh, Vicente Sovas can correct me, because it's not negative. Donna is. Is something it's the domina only... is the domina. It comes from uh, it comes comes from Latin. Is domina? Uh, yeah. uh, se, se la Madonna. Uh, sa signifi, uh, sa se, la, se, la, se la femme la com, uh, com un person a servir. Sa se yes. yes. So this was the, while speaking on a very critical way to us to the members of the parliament. He said that you you behave like a donna. It means the, the kind of okay, nice lady, which is dominant, etc. But she will not change the world. She will not change the world because of the age. She's experienced. She is nice. She is even polite. But no, for future, for future, we, we need a kind of change. So I, I it was it was a very, uh, a very interesting remark to, to all of us, to the politicians in Europe, you know, be careful, be careful, because you, of course, it's good that you behave in such a way, but you will not have the future. So, uh, so the question about future of Europe is our problem. I would like to thank all of you uh, for the very interesting speeches. I'm really sorry that we don't have time to, to reopen the debate with listeners, but it's also the same mistake that we have. Uh, we are trying to, to make as many uh, uh, distinguished guests as possible. And next we are uh, at the end. I would, on behalf of the, um, in, the, the uh, working group of the uh, Intercultural Interreligious Inter Dialogue, I would like to thank you very much. And I hope that it's not the last, last meeting because the question of family is, it's, is becoming more and more important. I don't know if Joe Georg would say at the end something. I would like to thank you very much. No, it's only uh, thanks God that's given this afternoon. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.